We'll open your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, this morning. Mark, chapter 3, and verse 20. Mark 3, 20. As you're turning there, I'm just going to take a little bit of a moment to kind of talk about a family, the strength of a family bond. You know, there's an old medieval proverb that says, blood is thicker than water. And uh, now that saying, if you actually think too long about it, might kind of start to break your mind as to trying to figure out what it meant. And uh, in fact, many have researched it to try and figure out how that actually fits together. And the, the historical and traditional meaning of it means that there is strength in the family bond. Uh, it's stronger than other bonds. It's the, exactly the same way that we normally use it. Uh, you know, you, I can pick on my sister, but don't you dare pick on my sister, okay? That's blood. It's thicker than water, and uh, we can continue on it. It stems, I think, from uh, the medieval times in Germany and flowed over into England and basically has remained the same as we uh, have, uh, have it today. So that even if family is estranged from one another, there's still a strong tie because they are family. So in a moment of crisis or need, family comes together. And if family is called upon, family will answer. At least that's the idea behind it. Yet the book of Proverbs teaches us that uh, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 18.24 that, in other words, sometimes there's a bond that's even greater than the bond of blood, one that is stronger. Perhaps this is why Christians at some point, probably in the last 50 years or so, uh, were prompted to try and rework that medieval proverb from blood is thicker than water to the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. I think that's a truthful statement. It actually inverts it, saying that, yes, your familial blood is strong, but the blood of the covenant, the blood of Jesus Christ that binds the Christian family together is actually even a stronger bond than the blood that you have that flows through your veins as to those of your family. It inverts the original meaning, pointing Christians to Christ. There are precious few things that are stronger than human blood, but Jesus introduces us to a bond that is stronger and deeper, a family that is bound by something greater than human bloodlines. This morning's message would be titled, The True Family of Jesus. Who is the true family of Jesus? As we go to the text this morning, i got three questions that I want to ask the text, and I want the text to answer for us. Who is Jesus? What is the unforgivable sin, and what is the will of God? Let's look at the Scriptures together. I invite you to stand with me as I read. I'm going to read verses 20 down through the end of the chapter in Mark 3. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul. And by the prince of demons he casts out demons. He called to them and he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself, and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and, and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came standing outside. They sent to him and called him. 
And the crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Father, I pray that you would bless your word to us this morning, and I pray that your spirit would come and give us understanding, illuminate the text, prepare our hearts to receive it, and change our lives by it, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, let me just kind of set the scene for you, because we're just dropping right into Mark chapter 3, unlike John, where we've been working through it, and you have a, a familiarity with where we have been, and direction of where we're going. Here, we're just kind of dropping into Mark chapter 3 and picking up a very controversial text, uh, one that has led to a lot of confusion. So let me kind of set the scene here. Um, At the beginning of the gospel of Mark, he introduces Jesus as the Christ. That happens in the very first verse. He says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is the very beginning of the presentation of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then he goes on to show us that this is being proclaimed by the voice of the messenger, who is John the Baptist, and confirmed by the voice of God at his baptism and demonstrated by the Holy Spirit coming down. So Jesus is the Christ. Verses 7 through 11 of Mark 1 say, And he, that is John the Baptist, preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove and a voice from heaven. You are my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. This is the opening scene in the the Gospel of Mark. Jesus is the Christ. John the Baptist is the messenger, and he comes and says, there's one coming greater. Jesus is baptized, comes out of the water. The sky is ripped open in this beautiful visual scene where the opening up, the Spirit descends like a dove is how it is described, falling upon Christ, falling upon Jesus. And then the voice of the Father, you are my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Clear markers of who Jesus is and the power that indwells Him. When Jesus starts His public ministry, we see Him then calling disciples, and they respond. We see Him healing sick, and they are healed. We see Him casting out demons, and they are set free. The people that He is associating with are often, though, the dregs of society. Even amongst the disciples, He's bringing in fishermen, He's bringing in tax collectors. Tax collectors, they were considered traitors among the Jews. Those that are pressing in and crowding around him are those who are sick, many of them unclean, ceremonially unclean, lepers, those who have been blind, lame, sick with all manner of disease, those who are demon-possessed. These are the outcasts, and these are the ones that are coming around him. Word is spreading that there is a miracle man. And the crowds continue to come. They continue to press against him. And as you read through the opening chapters of Mark, you'll find that the crowds keep getting larger and pressing against him harder, so much so that at one point he requests the disciples to have a boat ready for him, not to escape, but so that he can speak and teach without them pressing against him so that there is room. just want to press against him because they're hoping to touch him, and if they touch him, they're hoping to be healed. Well, as our passage opens, we find one of these scenes where the crowd is pressing against him. He's come to his home, the home where they're staying, and along with him, this massive crowd, and they come right into the home, and they press against him so tightly and pack in so tightly into the house that it says they can't even eat. There's no room to go and make a sandwich. You think of it. We think of our homes being full when, when every seat on the, on the couch is, is filled and 
we might have to bring an extra two or three chairs in, but this is so cramped that not only is every seat on the couch filled, every seat in the house filled, they're sitting on every piece of furniture. They're sitting on the kitchen counters. They're sitting on the table. They're sitting on the floor in between. You have to envision a house so packed that they're hanging out the windows. There's no room to move. Who is this crowd? This is the crowd of the sick, the demon-possessed, the lame. These are the ones that are pressing against him. Well, his family learns of this, and uh, they come to get him. (laughs) They're not real pleased about this. It says they came to seize him, or literally they came to arrest him. We're going to take him by force. We're going to drag him out of there and take him home. We have to stop him because he's uh, out of his mind, is what they say. And, and before you jump too hard on them, <laughs> Jesus is hanging around with all of those that, that they have been taught their whole life are to be outside of society. Demon-possessed, lepers, other outcasts, tax collectors. And not only that, But every time he comes in contact with the respected religious leaders, he gets into a tussle with them. He gets into a disagreement with them. Crazy people are surrounding him. The unclean are touching him. The respected religious leaders are denouncing him. So their family is coming and saying, we've got to get him out of here. He's out of his mind. (laughs) He's going to ruin our name. He's going to ruin our business. In the previous chapter, Jesus forgives the sins of a man who can't walk, and the religious leaders accuse him of blasphemy. We got to stop him. We got to bring him back home. So here is Jesus in the house, the crowd of undesirables packed around him so that he can hardly move. Religious leaders are outside wagging their heads as they consider who he is sitting with and what he is doing. The blood family is is calling for him to to come home before he embarrasses them any further. You know, Mark's writing is often filled with irony. And if you read through the Gospel of Mark carefully, you'll start to see that. It's filled with irony. He crafts these stories in such a way to draw us in with our common expectations and then show us often that the truth is the opposite. Well, here... Mark gives us this familial sandwich, if you will. He starts to talk about the family at the beginning of the passage. In verse 21, the blood family coming. He's out of his mind. We've got to get him. And then he doesn't talk about the family again until verse 31, when they finally arrive at the scene and demand that he comes out. And verse 33, Jesus responds to his family and says, Who are my brothers and sisters? Your family's here, Jesus, and they're calling you to come out. Who? Who is my family? Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? It's a shocking response from Jesus. I I think sometimes we kind of breeze over those things and get to the end of it and we're like, yep, we understand. We don't take time to let it sit in. This is a shocking response. It would be shocking in our culture. If you're to show up for your son or your brother, you say, hey, come on, we're here to pick you up. Come on out. Who is my family? I don't even know you. You're not really my family. It would be a shocking statement. But in Middle Eastern culture, it was dishonorable. Remember, he shared a physical bloodline with his brothers. They were, they were all from Mary. Mary was the woman who gave birth to him. She nursed him. She trained him. She cared for him. He is the oldest in the family. There were expectations that he would run the family business. And yet Jesus poses the question, who are my brothers? Who are are my mother and my brothers? I think this question is actually at the heart of the text. I think it drives the passage for us. Because it's, it's asking that question, who is the true family of Jesus? Because we often think in terms of bloodlines, Jesus is saying, who is my brother and mother? It's not the bloodlines. There's something deeper here. There's a family that's deeper. 
Now, the short answer is given in the next couple of verses, 34 and 35. He says, And looking about those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and brothers, for whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Now, we could just take that short answer and end right here, except that we need to unpack what that means. And it won't be understood fully without the teaching that's in the middle, which is the the, the difficulty of the text and the part that causes so many to struggle. And what concerns me most is that when we come to this passage, we focus in on the unpardonable sin and we get into theological discussions about it and we stir up all kinds of angst and fear and we miss the point of what Mark is trying to convey. He's talking about family. Who, what is the real family of Jesus? Like any good sandwich, it's what's in the middle that matters. It's the meat that determines what kind of sandwich it is, right? Turkey sandwich has turkey in the middle. Chicken salad has chicken salad in the middle. Ham has, I don't know why you need a ham sandwich, so we'll just forget about that one. Well, here in the middle is the teaching of Jesus to the scribes. And in it, it shows us what the will of God is. Now remember, the scribes, the religious teachers, these are the men who led, who led the church who would have known what the will of God is, right? If you want to know, this is where you would go. I think what Jesus is unfolding here is that even they didn't know what the will of God was. They weren't doing it. The teachers here are accusing Jesus of being possessed by Beelzebul and powered and directed by the prince of demons. Beelzebul, or Lord of the Dung, is the real name. Lord of the Flies is a derivative of it. It was a, a name of an ancient pagan god that the Jews had, had rightly ascribed to Satan. Lord of the Dung. It was a, a synonym for saying Satan or the devil himself. And then they said, he's, he's powered by the prince of demons. In other words, this is a double whamming. They're saying he's possessed by Satan, and he's powered by Satan. It's a strong statement. It's attributing the good works of Jesus to the power and authority of Satan. It's stating that Jesus is the lackey of Satan. He's the tool of the evil one. This is in sharp contrast to Mark's presentation at the beginning of the book in the prologue. Remember the first verse of the chapter that says Jesus is the Christ and those early verses that we read, like verse 10, where it says, and He came up out of the water immediately. We, he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on Him like a dove. The Holy Spirit descending on Him. Verse 12, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit immediately drove Him out into the wilderness. Jesus, according to the Scriptures, is possessed by the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus is directed by the Holy Spirit of God. In fact, I would argue that everything that Jesus does in His earthly life is powered by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit who indwells us. And the reason that Jesus functioned under the power and authority and direction of the Holy Spirit of God so that he can be a high priest who has experienced everything that we have. He can show us how we can do this by the power of the Spirit of God. We have everything we need for life and godliness. The weight of the accusations these religious teachers are making should not be easily dismissed. While well, they acknowledge that he is, in fact, casting out demons, they're attributing it to the authority of Satan. And Jesus responds with a couple of parables, parables of logic. Don't ever think that Christianity is illogical. Christianity is the epitome of logic. It is logic full. Jesus responds with these two parables of logic. The first one in verses 23 to 26, how can Satan cast out Satan? 
If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. Logic. It doesn't work. If the kingdom, he starts large and narrows it down. If the kingdom itself is warring against itself, that kingdom is not going to survive. A civil war breaks it apart. If a house, if a home is divided against itself, it won't survive. So if you have husband and wife warring against one another, it will not survive. The family will be ripped apart and consequently destroyed. And then he narrows it even deeper. If an individual is warring within himself, you will be split and fractured and destroyed. Now it's interesting, this parable that Jesus quotes here or gives us is actually more frequently attributed to Abraham Lincoln than it is to Jesus. Abraham Lincoln quoted the Scripture passage as the basis for his speech to the Illinois Republican State Convention on June 16, 1858, in a call to end slavery agitation. Essentially, what he was saying was, we've agreed to end slavery agitation, yet we're continuing it, so this isn't going to work. If we don't come to agreement and do what we said we're going to do, we're going to be destroyed. The government will not stand, and he went on to say, I don't think that's going to happen, and continued on his speech. But the point is, when people hear this, a house divided against itself shall not stand, they come to Abraham Lincoln and not the Lord Jesus Christ. Either way, the logic rings true from its most basic form. A kingdom divided cannot stand. Jesus is pointing out the the illogical nature of their accusation. You're saying that I'm accusing, you're accusing me of casting out demons by the power of the demon himself. That doesn't make any sense. That's counterproductive to what the evil one is trying to do. Remember, his goal is to steal, kill, and destroy. So why would he, why would he cast himself out? Parable number two goes a little deeper. Mark three twenty-seven. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed, he may plunder his house. Again, there is logic here. You can't take the possessions of a strong man unless you are stronger than that man. So if you go into the strong man's house and you say, I'm coming in and I'm going to take all of your goods, and you walk into the strong man's house to take your goods or his goods, you're not going to be able to do it. Because you're not strong enough to bind him. And if you're not strong enough to bind him, then he's just going to knock you in the teeth. He might bind you. He's probably going to take any, anything you have, any of your goods. He might just take you and add you to his possessions. That's what a strong man does when we don't bind him. You can't go into the strong man's house and take what he has unless you have a way to neutralize the power of the strong man. unless you're strong enough to bind him first. Now, here's where things begin to get a little deeper. There is a message that Jesus is sending here, a truth that he is revealing, and it's the answer to the first question that we were asking the text, who is Jesus? In this short parable, the strong man represents Satan, and the strong man's house and the strong man's goods represent Satan's household of captured souls those that he has possessed and taken in. Which, by the way, because of sin, is all of us. The only way to rescue these captured souls from Satan's grip is to first bind Satan. To neutralize his power. To tie him up. The only way to do that is to be stronger than him. We need someone that is stronger than the strong man. This stronger someone is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the illustration. That's at the crux of this parable. You've got to have someone stronger. Jesus is the one who is stronger. He is the one that has the authority, as Mark 1.27 says, because He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey Him. 
He commands the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Now, you might argue that the strong man commands unclean spirits. The strong man commands other unclean spirits. He himself is an unclean spirit. But Jesus commands all the unclean spirits. Jesus is not the lackey of saint, and saint is the lackey of Jesus. Regarding this passage, my friend and fellow pastor Brian Wilbur wrote this. He said, this passage is full of irony. Jesus' earthly family is on its way to seize Jesus because they think he's out of his mind. When in fact, Jesus has seized Satan and is restoring the minds of the demon-possessed people by casting out demons. Jesus is the one person who is completely in his right mind. And he is healing and restoring those whose minds have been poisoned by the enemy. It is actually Jesus' earthly family as well as the scribes who are currently lacking sound mind. Remember I said Mark's writings were filled with irony? You have the family of Jesus doing what most would appear to be logical. Let's come and get him before he ruins our name and brings Religious leaders identifying it and saying, this man is not from God. And being respected individuals, it is presumed they're in their right mind. And what Mark is doing is painting this picture so that we realize they're actually out of their minds as they accuse Jesus of being out of his mind. He is the only one who is rightly in his mind. So here is the question to who Jesus is. He is the deliverer. He's the deliverer. This is the whole point of Mark's gospel is to present Jesus Christ as the deliverer. He's the the stronger man who is able to bind up the strong man of the house and deliver the captive. He can set free the addicted, the sin-dominated, the tormented, the broken, the weak, the lame. By the power of the Holy Spirit, He seizes the stolen possessions and He restores them. He's stronger than the strong man. This is who Jesus is. Second question from the text, and it's an important one. What is the unforgivable sin? Now, if you're tracking properly, you're going to realize that you're part of the possession locked into the grip of Satan because of our sin. Jesus is the only one who can come in and set us free. You are the addicted. You are the sin-dominated. You are the weak. You are the broken. We are. So when Jesus begins to talk about an unforgivable sin, it starts to stir in our minds. It's a question that has plagued many people over the years, and it's often led to much confusion and a great deal of theological debate that's often not helpful. But before I address what it is, I probably need to establish the fact that there is an unforgivable sin because some have come to the conclusion that there isn't one. Some have argued that this, is, this was a sin that was only able to be committed while Jesus lived and therefore we don't need to worry about it anymore. That Jesus was speaking only to those who were there with him while he was alive, specifically the religious leaders, and that was really the only way it could be committed. Yet... The text puts no time markers in place. It doesn't tell us that only while Jesus is alive. In fact, it says, whoever, whoever commits this sin. Now we like whoever when we consider the gospel gift of salvation. Whoever believes in Jesus Christ will be saved. Whoever, whoever comes, Jesus will not cast out. We like whoever there because we say, I'm a whoever. I can come. But that same whoever is here. Often we try to sterilize this. We try to remove the fear that should not be removed. Whoever. Others will argue that this is merely referring to the here and now and that in the age to come this will change. As in, you may sin now, and it may be unforgivable now, but eventually, in eternity, all sins will have the opportunity to be forgiven. Please understand, verse 29, Jesus tells us that this is an eternal sin. That it will never be forgiven. 
meaning that it is a sin that will not be forgiven in this age or in the age to come, as Matthew 12.32 continues. Jesus is not messing around. We should not deal lightly with this. This is a matter of eternal consequence. We ought to understand what this sin is and what this sin is not. Fear should set in on us as we consider the eternal unforgiving nature of this sin. And I don't want to quickly sweep that away. But I do want to clear up confusion. Because there's been some confusion at times by those who believe that this is some sort of superstition. As in a a sequence of words, if we utter them in the right way, then it puts us beyond salvation. If I simply say, I blaspheme the Holy Spirit, then I can't be saved. A number of years ago, the co-founders of Rational Response Squad, uh, Brian and Kelly, uh, they keep their last names uh, out of the public eye, but uh, this Brian and Kelly formulated the, res- the Rational Response Squad. And what they were doing was challenging people, teens in particular, to record themselves blaspheming the Holy Spirit and then posting it on YouTube. And well, this resulted in a vast number of videos in which people would deny that the Holy Spirit existed. Some were simple, like that of Penn Jillette, Penn and Teller, the comedian. Penn Jillette, he simply said, I deny the Holy Spirit. Others were longer, equating the sovereign God with false deities before denouncing all of them, like a man named Joel who said, I deny the Holy Spirit as well as God, Jesus, Buddha, Zeus, Muhammad, Joseph Smith, SpongeBob, the Pope, Santa Claus, Mary or Mother Mary, the Easter Bunny, and the Tooth Fairy, Optimus Prime, all the saints, and Spider-Man. First, he equates the eternal sovereign God with created and imagined things, and then denies Him altogether. Perhaps even more dangerous than these bold blasphemies are those who deny believing in, in, in than, though, than of those who deny believing in God while professing they believe in God. In other words, some say, I believe in God and then deny Him with their words. This is far more common amongst people. We use it, and it often comes out in careless words. We say, I, be, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I pray to Him all the time. I was praying, oh, Oh, God, would you let my football team score a touchdown? Oh, thanks be to the football gods they scored. Or we pray we make it home safely. Oh, God, would you help us make it home safely in this storm? And then we get there and we say, whew, I was lucky enough to avoid that accident. You can thank your lucky stars for that one. I believe God will provide everything I need, but it won't happen because of it. If I didn't have bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. So so often these are just careless things that flow that seem innocent, seem not that big of a deal, but do you understand that each one of them is a blasphemy? So we are denying the sufficiency and power of the living God. I don't think that just uttering these statements means that you have committed the unpardonable sin. I cannot say that every denial of the power of Christ is an unpardonable sin. But I think these who made these YouTube videos, and I think so many others who profess Christ and deny His power, are on very thin ice. There is hope. And I don't think they automatically are all have committed this sin. Jesus did not say that the religious teachers who came there accusing Him to be under the power of Satan, Jesus does not say that they have committed the unpardonable sin. I think more of this is a warning. He's essentially saying, you're this close. This close. There is hope. Jesus said in verse 28, 
all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. Well, that should encourage your heart with some strength. When he says all sins will be forgiven, he's speaking of the sins that will that are repented of because that's what the whole of the Scripture teaches us. That's the point of the Gospel. That's the point of Jesus coming that we might repent and believe. So when we repent and believe, all sins are forgiven. Every blasphemy that we utter. So then when it slips off of our tongue, as it did this morning from my lips, I was talking with uh, Daniel just before the service, and I said, boy, that was lucky. I caught myself as soon as I said it. and said, what, what are you doing? We're about to talk about how easily we blaspheme God, and I just right off my lips. There is forgiveness for the children of God. All sins which we repent of. As Jesus hung on the cross, and the crowd was gathered around blaspheming him. Luke 23, 34 tells us what he said. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Thanks for the grace and mercy of God. The primary issue of blasphemy is not the words from the lips, but it's the condition of the heart that drives the words. Blasphemy is a word sin. Things we say, things we write. But the words that we say and the things that we write are only an overflow of what is in our heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. One who gets to the point of committing this unforgivable sin is one who has a heart so warped by evil that the person is incapable of believing truth. They move themselves to a point beyond the ability to repent and believe. The cross, the line where good things are now declared evil and evil things are now declared good, they twist. They rejoice in what God has called evil. They denounce what He has called good. professing to believe in Jesus, but denying the transformative power. Some come to a point where they outright reject God altogether. They twist it. They say He is an evil and vile God. And I will never believe in Him. Others come along and say, I believe in God, just not the way you describe Him in the Bible. This is what He looks like. I once knew a man who professed Christ all the days of his life. He grew up in the church. He married in the church. He raised his family in the church. He sang psalms and hymns and spiritual songs in the church. He went on missions trips with the church. And all the while, he lived a life of abomination before the Lord, the Lord he claimed to believe. And instead of believing that Christ, powered by the Holy Spirit, could transform him, he accused God of creating him to sin. And then twisted it and said, no, it's not evil. It's actually good. It's what God wants for me. My God is what He wants. He fought against the true Holy Spirit of God while claiming Christ as His Savior to His final breath. The prophet Isaiah pronounces woe on those words. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to them. Woe to the heart that calls the work of God evil. This is the heart that is beyond repentance. How and when a person moves in their heart beyond repentance is something that only God knows. Mark explains to us that the reason Jesus said this and taught this is because they were accusing the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of being unclean. These would have been the same people who claimed to be the children of God. They believed themselves only to have one Father, we learned that in John 8. 
I believe this sin occurs when the Holy Spirit reveals himself to that person, when he reveals Jesus as the Christ to the individual, and they deny the goodness and the power of him and accuse him of being powered by a devil. I can't can't be what he means because it doesn't line up with what I want, and they twist it. Well, as the scene moves forward here, The crowd is still pressing in, and we find the answer to our final question, what is the will of God? This question is prompted by the answer that Jesus gives regarding his true family. Who's my mother? Who are my brothers? Jesus said when they brought word that his family was outside calling for him. He looked around at the crowd. Here are my mother and my brother. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. What is the will of God revealed as to this crowd? Or by this crowd? Belief. Their belief in who Jesus is and the power by which he worked. They believed him to be the Christ. They believed him to be the son of the living God. They believed him to be sent by God, powered by God. They believe that he is the good news, that he is the deliverer promised in Genesis 3. You remember very, way back at the very beginning when Adam sinned and plunged all of humanity into sin? And God brought judgment on the serpent, and in the process of that he said, it's going to be an offspring of a woman who's going to crush your head. You'll bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. And from that moment, they were looking and searching and waiting for the deliverer. This crowd pressed in because they realized and believed Jesus is the one. He's the deliverer. He's the deliverer. They pressed in with all their affirmities that he would deliver them. No halfway. They didn't stand far off. They didn't try to get rid of their sickness or or lameness or brokenness. They didn't try to shed their addictions and their sins. They just pressed in. So often we think we need to clean up before we approach the Savior. As if bathing in a septic tank is going to make you smell better. You can't make yourself cleaner. Walter Marshall said in his book, The Gospel Mystery of Sanctification, quote, Give up the idea of purifying the flesh, your old natural man from its sinful lusts and inclinations. Do not think you will be able to attain holiness by your resolutions to do the best you can. Do not trust in Christ to help you keep those resolutions by your own efforts. Rather, resolve to trust in Christ to work in you, to will and to do by His own power according to His own good pleasure. You can't change yourself and come to Christ. You come to Christ to be changed by Him. This is why the crowd pressed in. Lepers, lame, paralytics, blind, sick of all kinds of infirmities, demon-possessed, the addicted, sin-ridden. They are all bound. We are all bound in the home of the strong man and Jesus comes as a stronger man. He has bound Satan and he delivers the captive. So press in and you are family. Press in so that you can touch the hem of of his garments. So that you may know him and be known by him. Believe that he is God and his power is good and holy. And if you struggle to believe, you say, I want to be family. I want to press into Jesus. I'm just, I'm so overwhelmed. 
crushed, I'm broken, I'm addicted, I'm sinful, I'm filthy. And I struggle to come to him because I'm not sure he really wants me. Let me just tell you, that also is sin. So press in. And if you don't believe, then be like the father of the little demon-possessed boy in Mark 9. This this father had been asking for his, his son to be delivered. The disciples were not able to. As Jesus comes back down from the Mount of Transfiguration, he finds this crowd there struggling because this little boy hasn't been delivered yet, and the father is in turmoil. And Jesus says to him, If you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe! Help my unbelief. You want to press in? You want to be in the crowd pushing in? Believe. And if you struggle, oh, cry out to God to help your unbelief. He will give you faith to believe. All things are possible with God. Those who believe are family, and the family will continue to press in. It's not your lineage, it's not your belief system, your background, or anything else. It is the fact that you come sinful and wretched, and you press into Jesus who changes you. You don't come in sinful and and wretched and sit there and say, I want to be family. I'm part of your family, but I know you really can't change me. You might be able to change the rest. You can't change me, so I'm just going to hang out here like this because I assume this is how I'm meant to be. Because then you're professing Christ and denying the power of God. Now you need to come and press in and say, I am wretched. I am filthy. I am sick. I am sin-ridden. I am addicted. I am an utter mess. A disaster. I stink. And just touch the hem of your garment. I can just be near you. God, I believe. Help my unbelief. But woe. Woe to those who have the form of godliness and deny the power of God. Woe to those who call good evil and evil good. Woe to those who claim the darkness is light and that light is darkness. Woe to those who out of an abundance of their heart deny Christ. Come to those who are weary. Come to those who are broken. Come to those who are captive. Come to Jesus. And believe that He is sent by the Father, powered by the Holy Spirit, and is the one and only Deliverer. Would you pray? Father, we thank You for Your Word. And I pray that Your Spirit would do what only You can do. We need to believe. And yet we are, we are weak. We are faithless people. And even when we utter the words of belief, Even in those moments, our hearts still deny us. And we struggle moment after moment, so help us to continually come and press in day after day after day and be like the crowd who started following Jesus and pressed in and pressed in everywhere He went, who continued to press in and ask questions. May we be the ones who press in to the Deliverer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.